Thank you for joining us on Journey to 600. Today we're going to be going over various cardiopalm conditions. First we're going to be going over angina, which is narrowing of one or more coronary arteries, and it can fall into three categories, stable, unstable, and variant. Signs and symptoms include tightness, pain, pressure, or squeezing in the center of the chest, pain in the left upper extremity and jaw, and shortness of breath and fatigue. Going back over the three categories, stable occurs predictably with activity, doesn't last longer than 15 minutes, while unstable is more serious because it occurs without cause, Variant often occurs at rest from midnight to morning, and those are the major differences between those three. Next is ruptured aneurysm. This is a life-threatening condition. Abdominal aortic aneurysms cause massive internal bleeding. Signs and symptoms include a different blood pressures in each arm, a drop in systolic blood pressure, extremities cold to the touch, and a bulge in the abdominal area. Next, we have atherosclerosis. It is hardening and narrowing of the arteries. Risk factors include age, smoking, inactivity, and cholesterol. Then we have pericarditis, which is irritated pericardium. Signs and symptoms include sharp chest pain, possible fear, and shortness of breath. Pericardial friction rub is present. Next, we have congestive heart failure. This is when the heart doesn't pump blood as efficiently as it should. For a PT, Trendelenburg is contraindicated, and it's important to know that they take medicines to lower their blood pressure, so you might not see a rise in their blood pressure with exercise. Signs and symptoms include cold hands and feet, dependent edema, increased fatigue, and bilateral lower extremity swelling. Rails are present, and it's important to note that diminished lung volumes is more of an obstructive or restrictive lung condition than it is congestive heart failure condition. Next, we have pulmonary edema, which is when fluid collects inside of your lungs and is usually caused by a heart condition, typically left-sided heart failure. It's also important to note that Trendelenburg is a precaution with pulmonary edema. A sign and symptom of this is decreased breath sounds and increased fremitus. Next is a pulmonary embolism, PE for short, and it is a clot to the lungs from an extremity. Common risk factors include a blow to the leg, athletic injury, surgery, radiation therapy, and prolonged periods of inactivity. Signs and symptoms include peripheral edema unilaterally and diaphoresis. Next, we have myocardial ischemia. This is when blood flow to the cardiac muscle tissue has decreased, which can lead to poor oxygen supply or hypoxia. Some people won't have signs and symptoms, but some might, and those signs and symptoms include angina pain with exer exertion and decreased activity tolerance. Some signs and symptoms are similar to a myocardial infarction. So a myocardial infarction, aka an MI, is when blood flow is completely cut off, resulting in cellular death or necrosis. And signs and symptoms vary from male to female. Um, we kind of all know what the male signs and symptoms are, so I made a point to focus on the females here, which includes mid-thoracic pain, weakness in one or both arms, feels like GERD, so antiacids will help. Some will have altered mental status, dyspnea, at rest or with exertion, and sleep disturbances. Men and women can have sweating and jaw pain. I would encourage you to go ahead and Google or look in your textbook about how the signs and symptoms vary from male to female. Next, we have a hemothorax. 
which is accumulation of blood in the pleural cavity and caused by trauma to the chest. There is decreased breathing sounds and a hyporesonance due to fluid. Then we have a pneumothorax, which is an accumulation of air in the pleural cavity caused by trauma. You will find decreased breath sounds and hyperresonance due to air. Then we have atelectasis, which is a collapse to part of the lung or complete collapse. It occurs when the alveoli within the lung become deflated. You will find decreased breath sounds and increased firminess. It's also important to note that when a lung collapses, the trachea will deviate away from the affected lung. Next, we have pleural effusion, which is fluid in the pleural cavity not caused by trauma. You'll have hyporesonance due to fluid, decreased fermentus and decreased breath sounds, and pleural friction rub may be heard. Next, we have pulmonary fibrosis, which is a restrictive lung disorder from lung damage and scarring, which decreases compliance of the lungs. Then we have emphysema, which is an obstructive lung disorder where air becomes trapped in the aeoli, which causes a barrel chest. It is associated with smoking. You will have hyperresonance and decreased breath sounds. There is a decreased elastic recoil due to too much compliance. Next, we have cystic fibrosis, aka CF. It is a genetic disorder that causes problems with breathing and GI. It is a thick, sticky mucus that blocks airways and leads to lung damage and makes infection more likely. Our final two conditions include respiratory distress, which can be caused by mucus plugging, a tube displacement, a disruption or disconnection of oxygen. Signs and symptoms include dyspnea, shortness of breath, cramping in calves, and cyanosis of the lips. And finally, we have sarcoidosis, which is growth of tiny collections of inflammatory cells in any part of your body, affecting the lungs and the lymph nodes. Signs and symptoms include increased salivation, skin lesions, liver involvement, joint pain, or swelling. Finally, we have made it to the practice question section of our video, so please take your time and answer the following questions. Okay, the correct answer is B. What is the proper protocol when administrating nitroglycerin? So I didn't go over it, but it was in our first slide. You want to have the patient take the nitroglycerin without water. You want to wait five minutes in between each dose, and you can only do a max of three doses before you probably need to recommend out, recommend them to go to the doctor, recommend them to go to the ER, whatever you see fit.
Okay, the correct answer is D. Most aneurysms occur in what location? The aorta. So I have no new knowledge to lay on you when it comes to this. This is a straight memorization question. So here you go. I have provided it to you. There's the answer. Um, I didn't specifically say it in my video, but we did briefly touch on uh, ruptured aneurysms and I only focused on aortic. Okay, the correct answer is D. A patient with CHF should limit and or avoid what types of food? The correct answer is salt and alcohol. So consuming too much salt can result in fluid retention, even in the healthiest person. So in those with heart failure, excessive sodium can lead to some serious complications, can worsen blood pressure, and it can exacerbate existing heart failure symptoms. Then there's alcohol. The thing about heart failure is it prevents the heart from pumping as well as it used to, and alcohol can make that problem worse and may weaken the heart muscles even more. It's best to avoid all forms of alcohol, including wine. Okay, the correct answer is B. Your patient presents to you with bilateral lower extremity swelling, dependent edema, and rails are present during auscultations. What cardiopalm condition does your patient most likely have? Let's go through each answer. So A, deep vein thrombosis, aka DVT. So with the DVT, you're going to have unilateral swelling. So the affected limb with the clot in it is going to be the one swelling. In this case, we have bilateral lower extremity swelling. So you could go ahead and mark off A. Then we have B, congestive heart failure, which, which I mentioned in my slides that you would have cold hands and feet, dependent edema, increased fatigue, bilateral lower extremity swelling, and rels are present. So B is our correct answer, and if you need to go back in the slides and kind of have a refresher, make charts to help you remember all the signs and symptoms of these different cardiopulmonary conditions, please feel free to do so. It makes it easier to keep it all organized. Then we have C, which is a pulmonary embolism. This is when a clot travels to the lungs from an extremity, aka a DVT. So signs and symptoms are going to be um, unilateral edema, diaphoresis, and common risk factors are those things like surgery, leg injury, long periods of inactivity. So it doesn't really line up with what our patient is presenting with now. Um, also with a PE, this is, this is life-threatening. You have a clot that's been thrown to your lung. So your patient's probably going to have shortness of breath and fatigue and all those different things and would need to be sent to the ER immediately. Then we have D, atelectasis. This is a partial or complete collapse of the lung. In my description, I never mentioned anything of 
leg swelling and edema and rels. I only mentioned decreased breath sounds and increased fermentus and that the trach would be deviated away from the affected lung. So this is not lining up with our current patient. Okay, this next one is just a fun little matching game. It's not like anything that's going to be on your boards, but I remember when I was studying from the boards, I kept getting these confused because some had fluid, some had air, some, you know, had blood, some were disorders, and some were traumatic injuries. So please take your time and try and figure out and match what condition goes with what description. Okay, here are the answers. Let's go through each of them. So hemothorax, this is when there's blood in the pleural cavity due to trauma. Pleural effusion is when there's fluid in the pleural cavity, not due to trauma. Didn't include that here, but it's not due to trauma. Pneumothorax, this is when there is air in the pleural cavity. Atelactasis is a partial or complete collapse of the lung. Pulmonary edema is when there's fluid collecting inside of the lungs, usually caused by a heart condition. And then um, emphysema is an obstructive lung disorder. So I hope that helped. I found it really helpful to put charts together, kind of comparing things and how they're similar and how they're different. So Take that as you will. Do it if you want. Thank you for joining us today on Journey to 600. Please like, subscribe, and turn on your notifications so you know when we post our next video. Bye!